Oh, so you've already hit the thing? Yep. Okay. So let's see. We've done the basics of angular momentum, and then we connected what we know about angular momentum to spherical coordinates. Now I have to tell you about something that's kind of puzzling, and it's that for mass zero, then the treatment I've been giving about angular momentum isn't quite right. Instead of 2J plus 1, states 1 has 2, or let me just say there are 2. So this is the case, of course, for the photon, and also for the graviton, and for any other spin one half, spin, I'm sorry, for any other mass zero particles. You all know this implicitly or explicitly, because with the photon, you know there are two states of polarization. One can talk about the photons moving in the z direction. You can say it's x polarization or y polarization, or equivalently, you can call it right circularly polarized or left circularly polarized, or some other combination. But in any case, you have two states, and the same is true for the graviton. The reason for all this goes back to, and frankly, this is sort of hard to understand, which is why I basically skipped it. The basic idea is to think about things relativistically, and to imagine you have some standard Lorentz transformation that takes you to, takes you from some reference state to a state of momentum p. Now for a massive particle, the reference state is just the particle sitting there at the origin, not moving at all, and so then you boost it from that state up to a state of momentum p. Then you make some arbitrary Lorentz transformation on it. Now it has momentum lambda l, lambda p, and so now you do the inverse Lorentz transformation, and of the standard form, you see, with the Lorentz transformation that takes you from one frame to another, you've got a certain amount of arbitrariness in rotations. You can put in extra rotations, and so that's why this is a standard transformation set by convention. And this thing is called W, and, or actually it's W of lambda in p, I think, if I get this right. I'm doing this somewhat from memory. And this thing is called the little group, and it turns out the little group is just SO3, the rotation group, if m is greater than zero, but it's something different if the mass is zero. Then the fiducial state is not the particle at rest. The fiducial state is the particle, is the photon, say, moving along the z direction, and of course it's moving always at the speed of light. And so when one goes through this analysis, one doesn't find that the little group is SO3. One finds the little group is, if I'm not mistaken, ISO2, which is translation in a plane. And you want, basically, rotations in a circle. And it's the rotations in the circle, then, that give you the right circularly polarized or left circularly polarized. 
So I'm just mentioning that um, because, of course, it's, it's physically very important, but the mathematics here, um, the only place I've ever seen that mathematics described is in Chapter 2 of Volume 1 of Weinberg's three-volume treatise on quantum field theory. Um, it, there may be other places uh, where it's done equally well or more clearly, I don't know. Weinberg tends to produce the clearest description of anything. Um, this stuff, I guess, needs to be sorted out a little bit more. But anyway, that's the story, and I don't think maybe you guys have some questions. All right. Okay, well, remember I, um, I do have, um, oh, I forgot to bring the crackers. Let me. It's just 
it's, it's just, if you've never handled it, it's unfamiliar. And um, um, an example of this, well, let's see, I don't want to, I mean, the, the subject that I'm about to start is intrinsically, it's an addition of angular momenta, and so clearly you have a, two systems, the angular momentum for system one, the angular momentum for system two, and so you have to use this notation. Um, and I'm just a little worried that if I just start into the mathematics, if you haven't seen this in a while. It seems to me, though, that in Messier somewhere there must be a detailed description of this, because if there's one thing the French are good at, apart from sex and food and wine, it's um, mathematics. Um, and so, and, and moreover, they also t are very good at explaining mathematical things. And so I urge all of you, whether you saw this in 521 or not, to find a place in Messier, probably volume one, somewhere in there, find a place where he describes this thing. It's sometimes called a tensor product. It's also sometimes called a direct product. And um, I've never, I'm not good at names, uh, either for people or physical con mathematical concepts, but, um, or physical concepts, but it's one of these names. And, um, uh, it might be called composite systems. But in any event, uh, I urge you to read that description, and it's probably a very clear description, and it'll, it, it'll be important because anything you do in the laboratory or in theory is going to involve, sooner or later, composite systems um, or tensor products, basically. All right, so what we're going to be talking about here is J1 and J2. Um, and this comes up as soon as you discuss the hydrogen atom uh, in any detail. That is to say, if you just are talking about the, the electron going around the proton, you ignore the spin of the electron, then you just have the orbital angular momentum of the electron. And then you just have one J. Uh, and I, I just use J as a generic angular momentum. Um, but as soon as you get serious, then you have to say, well, this electron has spin. It has spin one half. And um, in fact, that's more angular momentum than you have in the ground state of hydrogen, where the orbital angular momentum is zero. And so you've got then two spins. You've got the orbital angular momentum. So this might be L for an electron. And this might be the spin angular momentum. And the total of these two would be the total angular momentum. And so that's what we're going to be talking about in general here, is adding two angular momentum together. And the question is, how do you go about that? And what's, what's going on? Well, um, one set of states for this is the eigenvectors of J1 squared, J2 squared, J1z and J2z. Whenever I say J2z, I think of a jacuzzi. Um, although I've only been in a jacuzzi once at most, maybe no, a few times, I guess, but it's, it's, it's not something that I grew up with. Um, anyway, the eigenstates of this are the things we already know about. Basically, this, we can write them like this, J1, J2, M1, M2, and these will be J1, M1, direct product or tensor product with J2, M2. And the deal, of course, is that J1 squared on J1, M1, is equal to h bar squared j1, j1 plus 1, j1, m1. And um, j1 
J1Z on J1, M1, OB, HR, M1, J1, M1. And the same thing for J2 on these states. So J2 squared on J2, M2, HR squared, J2, J2 plus 1, J2, M2, and J2Z, J2, M2, HR, M2, J2, M2. So those are the states. This is one set of states, then, that we are talking about. And we can also write this as J1, M1, J2, M2. This notation has the advantage of being reasonably succinct and clear. This is more succinct, and this is the conventional notation. The trouble is, when you look at this conventional notation, you sometimes don't know what the hell it is that's being represented here. And so this can be a somewhat confusing notation. It's not confusing if you have J1, J2, M1, M2. But if you have 3, 2, 1, 0, then you're not sure whether that refers to J1, J2, M1, M2, or to another description of this space. And this other description is in terms of the total angular momentum. And so let's go toward that total angular momentum a little bit slowly first. Let's notice that these eigenstates, these composite or direct product or tensor product eigenstates, are eigenstates of Jz, which is J1z plus J2z. And that's pretty clear from the nature of the tensor product here. Remember, I have chocolate and other sweets as rewards for questions. So you may ask questions, and you don't even have to be registered for the course to ask a question. All right, so let's just see what happens here. Jz on J1, J2, M1, M2 is J1z plus J2z on, and in fact, maybe I should write that. You know, after saying all this to you, I almost think that we should abandon this conventional notation. This is the conventional notation. But this is almost as easy to write, and it is infinitely clearer. So I'm going to try to give this lecture in terms of the clearer notation. So shall I do that, or is that going to be counterproductive? In other words, this is – and so what this thing is is J1z on J1, M1 times J2, M2 plus J1, M1, J2z, J2, M2. And this, of course, is H bar M1, and this one, H bar M2 on J1, M1, J2, M2. So in other words, this thing is the same thing as Jz on J1, M1, J2, M2. All right, is that clear? So that's how the direct product notation works. J1z is the sum of L1z plus S1z? 
J1Z is the sum of J. Let me let me listen. So again, J1Z is the sum of L1Z and S1Z. It could be, but I'm not I'm not going there. I'm not going in that direction. Instead, what I'm saying is the J1Z might be LZ and J2Z might be SZ. OK, so I'm just thinking in terms of two systems. You're splitting it up into three systems. You're saying that J1 might be composite and also J2. I'm just taking J1 and J2 as two angular momenta. And as an example, J1 might be L, the orbital angular momentum. J2 might be S. But it's possible that we're not talking about that at all. We may be talking about two different particles in which each of them. We might be talking about the spins of the two different particles. So we might be combining a particle that has. So this might be the spin of one particle and this is the spin of the other particle. So it's just that both are angular momenta. And the point is, we know that if we have two. If we have one angular momentum, then these are the eigenstates of J1Z and J1 squared and J1Z. And these are the eigenstates of J2 squared and J2Z. We put them together in a direct product and we see that we have eigenstates not only of J1 squared, J2 squared, J1Z and J2Z, but also eigenstates of Jz, where Jz is J1Z plus J2Z. And the eigenvalues now are these. Is that all right? OK, now these states are complete and orthonormal. And I can write them. I'm going to use this. I'm going to sort of switch over to this notation just because it's so much simpler. I mean, it's so much clearer. It's not as simple as actually more complicated. This inner product. Now, what is this inner product? Well, the inner product of states, something that I should have mentioned over here when I was giving my lightning review of tensor product notation. This thing is just this one and that one. And so this is simply delta M1 and 1 prime delta M2 and 2 prime. OK? So these are orthonormal. And in the conventional notation, this thing is fact. OK, so these are the, these then are, these states here, which are written either like this or like that, are eigenstates of Jz, as well as of J1 squared, J2 squared, J1 and J2 squared. Now, we're going to introduce other states now that are going to be eigenstates of J1 squared and J2 squared, but also of J squared and Jz. And so first of all, let's check the J equals J1 plus J2 is an angular momentum. And what that means is does it have the right commutation relations? And I'm just going to check the commutation relations of J with itself. This, we want this to be I H bar sum on K epsilon I J K J K. That's what we want. Well, what do we have? Well, we know 
the J1I, J2J equals, what would that be? Zero. Right. This is zero because the systems one and two have nothing to do with each other. So those commutators are zero. And so we take then J1I, J1J is J1I plus J2I, J1J plus J2J is equal to, well, J1 with J, J1I with J2J is zero. J2I with J1J is zero. So we just have to do this commutator and that one. So this is J1I, J1J plus J2I, J2J. And this, of course, then, let me take this up here. This is equal to then I H bar sum on K, and let me just say epsilon I J K, J1 K plus epsilon I J K, J2 K. Combining the two together, and that, of course, is I H bar sum on K, epsilon I J K, J K. So, indeed, we have that J1, J2 is I H bar sum on K, epsilon I J K, J K. So the sum of J1 plus J2 gives us three operators that are angular momentum. They satisfy the commutation relations that we used a week ago or so to derive all those properties of angular momentum. And in particular, we know that J squared will commute with J Z. That's one of the relations. And another way of saying this is since this is an angular momentum and since this is a scalar, the scalar doesn't change under rotation, so that commutator is zero. Any questions? Now, I don't quite know where to write. J squared is J1 plus J2 squared. And this is going to be J1 squared plus J2 squared plus 2J1 dot J2. And if I continue this up here, this is J1 squared plus J2 squared plus 2J1 Z J2 Z plus 2J1 X J2 X plus 2J1 Y J2 Y. And we can rewrite that as J1 squared plus J2 squared plus 2J1 Z J2 Z plus J1 X plus I J1 Y J2 X minus I J2 Y plus J1 X minus I J1 Y J2 X plus I J2 Y. Okay, so that's some arithmetic algebra there. And you remember we introduced J plus and J minus. And so what this tells us is that J 
J squared is equal to J1 squared plus J2 squared plus 2J1ZJ2Z plus J1 plus J2 minus plus J1 minus J2 plus. Now, why did I do all that? I did all that because so far we have J squared commuting with JZ, but now we see that J1, well, let me just say J squared, comma, J1 squared is zero. And why is that? Well, this would be J1 squared plus, well, forget about J2 squared, because it commutes with J1 squared, because it's system one and two. Then it would, then we have all these other terms. And in these other terms, so let me see, I bet I'm going to do it this way. This would be J1 squared with J1 squared. That's obviously zero. But then we have two J1Z with J1 squared times J2Z plus J1 plus commutative J1 squared times J2 minus plus J1 minus commutative J1 squared J2 plus. All of these are zero. This is zero because it's a thing in itself. This is zero because J1Z generates rotations about the z-axis and J1 squared is scalar. This is zero because both Jx and Jy commute with J1 squared and the same thing over here. So this thing is equal to zero. And the same thing can be said about J2. J squared with J2 squared. So now what we've got then are, we have one big, we have the combined angular momentum J, J1 plus J2, and J squared equals J1 plus J2 squared. We have that J squared commutes with Jz, Jz being, of course, J1z plus J2z. And now we found that J1 squared and J2 squared also commute with J squared. And so now we have four commuting observables. J squared, Jz, J1 squared, and this is supposed to be common. J2 squared. So these are four observables that all commute with each other. So that's what we've shown so far. And moreover, they're also all permission operators. So we have simultaneous eigenstates. And these simultaneous eigenstates are J1, J2, Jm. This is the conventional way of writing it. And I think these equations will be clearer if we stick with the conventional way of writing these new states and the clear way of writing the states we started with. So these are eigenstates of J1 squared on this, of course, this H bar squared J1, J1 plus 1, J1, J2, Jm, J2 squared, J1, J2, Jm, H bar squared J2, J2 plus 1. Jm and also J squared on J1 J2 Jm. What is this? This chair seems to be bosoms in the center of the room here. Um, thank you. This is H bar squared J J plus one. 
J1, J2, JM. And then we have JZ on J1, J2, JM. And this is going to be H bar M, J1, J2, JM. Okay. So this is what we know. This part here, these last two equations, come from the fact that we've just proven that J is an angular momentum. And the upper two equations come from the fact that we know what the eigenvalues of J1 squared and J2 are, because J1 and J2 are also angular momentum. And we also know that M is less than or equal to J and greater than or equal to minus J, because we've proved that for any angular momentum, including this big J, which is the sum of J1 plus J2. All right. Any questions? Let me mention... No. Let me mention that... By the way, you don't need to take detailed notes, because these notes are online, although I use the conventional notation throughout. Let me just mention that it's not true that everything can be used, because, for example, J squared, J1, Z, is not equal to zero. And, of course, J squared, J2, Z, therefore, is also not equal to zero. So you can't increase this set of four commuting observables. You can't increase it. Notice, in both cases, we have four commuting observables. Over here, they are J1 squared, J2 squared, J1, Z, and J2, Z. Over there, J squared, J, Z, J1 squared, and J2 squared. All right. So we now have two orthonormal, two complete orthonormal, sets of orthonormal states, two bases, J1, M1, J2, M2, also known as J1, J2, M1, M2. This is the conventional way of writing it, but I think this causes confusion. And the other one is J1, J2, J, M. So these are going to be the two sets of states. We have two different bases for our vector space, the vector space for the system of two angular momenta. And what we want to do is we want to see what the relations are between these vectors. And these relate, and we want to see a few more, we want to learn a few more things. So let me get to the, let me do the really important things that we need to learn first, and then I'll get to the inner products between these vectors. And between the pairs of vectors, one from each basis. And these are the much feared Gordon coefficients. And they start out being tied to just the name Fletch, which is almost impossible to spell. Okay, well, let's look at what state has the highest value of JZ. Or what I mean is the highest eigenvalue of JZ, M, H1. What would the state be? Well, in the first basis, it would clearly be the state J1, J1, J2, J2. In other words, you'd have the thing maximum spin off. Okay? So that's that one. And so we know then that JZ on J1, J1, J2, J2, in fact, is of course J1Z 
on J131. What? Whoops. Times J231 plus J2. This stuff is a little bit tricky. You see why it is they don't teach it. They don't have to. And so this one is M and some M and all. It's J1, H4, J1, J1, J2, J2, plus J1. That's supposed to be a 1. J1, J2, H4, J2, J2. And so all together this is H4, J1 plus J2, J1, J1, J2, J2. Okay. So the state in the first basis that we started with, the state that has the highest eigenstate, all of these states, in other words, are clearly eigenstates of the composite JZ. The one with the highest value of M is the one I just wrote down, and the highest value of M is J1 plus J2 times H1. So that's the highest eigenvalue of JZ for the composite system. Now, what state over here has the highest value? Well, this one, the state with the highest value of JZ in this other basis, J1, J2, Jn, this would be the state J1, J2, Jj. This has the highest, has highest JZ eigenvalue. Okay? The state in this basis with the highest value of JZ will be the state Jj. And so then what we learn then is that the highest value of J is equal to J1 plus J2. So what we've learned something sort of through the back door in a sense, that just by looking at the JZ values, we see that the composite angular momentum eigenvalue, the eigenvalue of J squared, the highest eigenvalue, it corresponds to the value J, J1 plus J2. Because if there were a higher one, we'd get a value of JZ would be higher, and that would be a contradiction. So we know then that this set of states here has values, J1 and J2, by the way, are completely fixed throughout the whole lecture, I mean, for each system. What's going to vary is J and N, and we see the biggest value J can be is J1 plus J2. The question now is what's the minimum value? And to figure that out, we're supposed to minimum value, but minimum eigenvalue, well, you know, the eigenvalue is really H plus squared J, J plus 1. So I'm just talking about the minimum parameter J0, or if you want eigenvalue H plus squared J0, J0 plus 1. So I'm trying to find the minimum value of J0. Well, suppose it is J0. Then we know there are going to be two J0 plus 1 states of the form J1, J2, J0, M. And again, we're, as usual, talking about a massive particle. It's a massless particle. There are just two states. And then we have the next highest angular momentum, and we know that the possible values of angular momentum, you remember we showed, or at least of this quantum number, J, 
were 0, 1 half, 1, 3 halves, and so forth. Uh, half, they're half integer eigenvalues. And um, um, let's see, I slipped in this slipped in here something that, um, that I guess I haven't explained. It didn't occur to me when I wrote the notes. Um, the explanation may be a bit deep here. Um, well, the point is, so I'm, I'm, I'm doing this sort of as a hand wave here a little bit. In other words, this suppose this J0, suppose it were 0. Well, how do we know that this one isn't 1 half? Why does it have to be 0 plus 1? The reason is that we don't, we don't expect our system to flip-flop between bosons and fermions. We're either dealing with bosons or we're dealing with fermions. And um, so, if we're dealing with fermions, then this would be one half, this would be three halves. And if we're dealing with bosons, this might be zero, this might be one, or this might be two, and this might be three. But we don't expect it to flip between bosons and fermions. So, there are how many states here? Well, there are two J0 plus one states of that kind. And we go all the way up to the state J1, J2, J1 plus J2, J1 plus J2, and, and these then have two J1 plus J2 plus one states. Okay. So that's the total number of states. Now, there must be as many states in this basis as in this basis, and we know how many there are in this basis because we know there are two J1 plus one states here and two J1 plus one, two J2 plus one states here. So the total number of states is two J1 plus one times two J2 plus one. And so what we have then is that the sum from J equals J0 is J1 plus J2 of 2J plus 1 has to equal 2J1 plus 1 times 2J2 plus 1. So this is the number of states in the first basis, and this is the number of states in the second basis where these states go from J1, J2, J0, and up to J1, J2, J1, J2, J2, and Okay. Now this sum here is the sum J equals 0 to J1 plus J2 to J plus 1 minus the sum J, J equals 0 to J0 minus 1 to J plus 1. And there's this famous theorem that was proven by one of those prodigy, mathematical prodigies, the sum, when he was, I think, in grammar school, the sum of n from 0 to capital N is capital N over 2, n plus 1. And, of course, the sum of 1 from 0 to n is just equal to n plus 1. All right. So we can use those to figure out what this is. And what we get is that this is equal to 2 j1 plus j2 over 2 j1 plus j2 plus 1. So this, this tube is that tube. And the sum of j is from 0 to j1 plus j2, j1 plus j2 over 2 times 
that. And then we subtract. Um, oh, I have to do then the sum on 1, and that is just j1 plus j2 plus 1. And now we're subtracting 2 over 2, j0, j0 minus 1, because we're just going up to j0 minus 1, and then minus j0. So our equation is this equals that. And the solution then is the j0 squared is equal to j1 plus j2, j1 plus j2 plus 1, plus j1 plus j2 plus 1, minus 2j1 plus 1. 2j2 plus 1. And that's equal to j1 squared plus j2 squared plus 2j1 j2 plus 2j1 plus 2j2 plus 1 minus 4j1 j2 minus 2j1 minus 2j2 minus 1. And altogether that is j1 minus j2 squared. So the minimum value of J0 is J1, which is the J0 due to the absolute value of J1 minus J2. It has to be positive. And so that's, that's our result. And uh, So now we have two bases, and we know what the stakes are. We have two, we have this set that we started with, and then we have this set, set where of course m is less than or equal to j, greater than or equal to minus j, and j is less than or equal to j1 plus j2, and greater than or equal to the absolute value of j1 minus j2. And it goes in steps of one, as does M. So it stays within either bosons or bosons. I wonder if there's, a, there's probably a tighter way of doing that argument, but I don't know what that might be. All right, any questions? A couple of material. All right, now, we know that uh, both bases form the resolution of the identity operator. It could write like that, I guess. Anyway, one is sum m1 minus j1 to j1. Sum m2 minus j2, j2, j1, j2. M1, M2. Oh, that's the conventional notation. Well, let me write it both ways. That's the conventional notation. This problem with this notation is that it can be confusing. So let me rewrite this. Second basis, namely J1, J2, Jm, that this is equal to this sum M1 equals minus J1, J1, M2 equals minus J2, J2 of J1, M1, J2, M2. Now, this inner product of J1, 
M1 to M2 with the state, J1, J2, Jn. So this inner product here is between this state and this state. You see why people use the conventional notation, because in the conventional notation, this would have been written J1, J2, M1, M2, and this would be J1, J2, Jn. And it's easy to buy that that's a nice, simple inner product, where when you write it this way, it doesn't look as nice, but it's a lot clearer. Okay. Now, these numbers, which are these inner products, or equivalently these, these things are called the Klebsch Gordon coefficients. In fact, I spent so much effort spelling Klebsch correctly that I may have misspelled Gordon. It's maybe an O. Does anybody know if it's Gordon or Gordon? Probably Gordon. Does anybody know? Gordon? That looks right. All right. Anyway, I'll have to get that one right. So these are the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. Now, let's make an obvious observation here. These states over here, these new states that we're introducing, each one we can multiply by an arbitrary unimodular complex number, an arbitrary phase factor, and everything is perfectly consistent. And so there are at least two conventions for how you define these states. And the important thing is don't mix the conventions. So if you're in one convention, fine. If you're in the other convention, fine. If you invent your own convention, fine. But don't mix conventions where you get into trouble. Now, we can say something simple about these Klebsch. These things are called Klebsch's in the tray. Notice that, of course, zero is Jz minus J1z minus J2z, because that's just the definition of Jz. So if we put this in between these vectors that make up the Klebsch, in other words, J1, M1, J2, M2, Jz minus J1z minus J2z, J1, J2, Jm, then this state is an obvious eigenstate of these two operators, and this state is an eigenstate of this operator. And so what we get here is H bar M minus M1 minus M2 times J1, M1, J2, M2, J1, J2, Jm. All right. So if this is not zero, when this is not zero, that has to be zero. And so that means that for all these Klebsch's, the thing is zero unless M equals M1 plus M2. So this is the general rule for when the Klebsch's are non-zero. All right. So that's clear. All right. Now, if we go beyond that and actually compute some of these Klebsch's, we get this recursion relation, which I'm going to have time to derive it, and I hope I'm going to have time to do at least a simple example. All right. 
the basic rule that we're going to use for all of this is J plus minus on Jm, we proved last time, is h bar square root J minus or plus M, J plus or minus M plus 1. And the plus 1 you can think of, you can put it there if you want, which is probably where it belongs. Anyway, on the state, J M plus or minus 1. So that's the basic rule that we learned when we, a couple of periods ago. So what we're going to do then, and of course, as you know, J plus or minus is J1 plus or minus I J2. All right, so now we start out then with J plus or minus on J1, J2, Jm. So this is then h bar square root of J minus or plus M. And I'm going to write it this way because it's a little bit clearer. Whoops. Okay, so this is because, this is where we're using the full J, which is J1 plus J2. And that J plus or minus, and that raises or lowers, and we get this factor. On the other hand, this thing is equal to J1 plus or minus plus J2 plus or minus acting on. Now we've got the right-hand side of this thing. In other words, we're applying J plus or minus to this state here, which is now expressed in terms of all of these states, these basic states that we started with, times these clutches. And so this is the sum, and I'm just going to write it over M1, M2. I don't know why I need to prime any notes. There's no reason for that. So this is J1, M1. J2, M2, times these clusters, J1, M1, J2, M2, on J1, J2, Jm. So these guys are numbers. These are the clutches. These are the vectors here. And now these operators are going to hit these. And the way they do that is... This is the sum on M1, M2, and of course M1 goes from minus J1 to plus J1, and the same similarly for M2. This is J1 plus or minus on J1, M1 times J2, M2 plus J1, M1 J2 plus or minus on J2, M2. All right. And what this is, again, using this rule, is, if we want, we can factor out the H bar. M1, sum over M1, M2, big parenthesis, square root of J1 minus or plus M1, J1 plus 1, plus or minus M1, times J1 M1, J2, whoops, be careful, this is J1, M1 plus or minus 1. J1 
J2M2 plus square root of J2 minus or plus M2 J2 plus 1 plus or minus M2 I'm almost going a bit dizzy here J1 M1 J2 M2 plus or minus 1 and all these guys are multiplied by the same pledge ooh, ooh, ooh. you guys you guys should have said something to me this thing here is multiplied by this pledge and this is the equation and now what you do is you take an inner product from the left with one of the basis states of this form and bingo you get a uh, you get a relationship among the clutches. So let me let's see if we've got four minutes to do that. Problem in space though as well as time. This is a relativistically covariant problem here. Um, all right. Now I see why in my notes I use primes over everything over all the ends. Uh, when we're going to take this inner product, we of course know that J1 M1, J2 M2, so imagine there are primes on all these ends. Okay? Um, maybe what I should do is put primes on these guys. All right, let me put primes on these guys on J1 M1 J2 M2 because it's delta M1 M1 prime delta M2 prime M2 now that's fine for the top line, well, the top line, actually, no, this is going to be just directly a flesh. Um, but that rule, you see, that rule implies also that zero zero is equal to J1 and one prime J two and two prime J one and one J two and two is delta M one prime M one delta M two prime M two plus or minus one. And transforming the primes and the young primes. Oh, 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 wait a minute. I'm sorry. This, this. Oh. All right. I, I mentioned, I mentioned that something. This 
thing is going to be delta and one prime delta and one prime and one plus or minus one delta and two prime and two. And similarly, let me just see if I've got that right. Yeah, and one prime has to be m one plus or minus one and two prime has to be m two. And the other one is zero is j one and one prime j two and two prime on j one and one j two and two plus or minus one is delta and one prime and one delta and two prime and two plus or minus one. So those are the orthogonality relations that we expect and are clear and obvious. Now we have to apply them to here. And when we do, excuse me, so the, the equal zeros, that puts a requirement on the vector n. Say that again. So you have that equal to zero. Yes. That just, that's that's going to put a requirement on what your values of n and n2 are. Right. When we take, when we take, what we're going to do is we're going to take an inner product of this equation. Remember, this equation is the following. It's the, let me use the yellow chalk. It's that this thing here is equal to this thing here. You want chocolate or chocolate? All right. So here's what we get. So little space. Um, maybe I'll go over here. What do you think? What is it? Actually, it's forty six. Um, which 
one can then choose in a, in a, in a reasonable way. Next time, I'll do some examples for you. And when I do the examples, you'll see, you'll say, why did he make it so complicated on Monday? And um, so it'll become simple when you see the examples. I'm going to do the examples uh, on Wednesday. And um, so that'll be that. So the homework, we, I, I gave in. I'm, I'm too much of a softy, but I gave in. So the homework, instead of being due Wednesday, it'll be due next Monday. But um, the next homework is due two weeks from this Wednesday. And uh, I'll post them in a few days. Any questions? Sorry it's so complicated, that's just the way it is.